plus their headaches are generally accepted by those physicians that understand what they really are as the most painful condition known to man. I mean, it goes past the point of being in shock, where if somebody was in an accident and their arm was crushed and they kind of go into shock and kind of, you know, blocks out a lot of that pain and you're not really sure what's going on. But the pain from cluster headaches, I mean, just zips right past that. And so you don't even go into shock. So people normally, um, once it starts and once it's up to its peak, they'll be on their hands and knees, banging their head on the floor, trying to knock themselves out or in the shower, banging their heads on the ceramic tile, trying to knock themselves out. And it's impossible to knock yourself out. The pain just keeps you in the moment. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. This is a podcast that explores topics related to psychology, spirituality, psychotherapy, science, consciousness, relationships, and a number of other topics that all hold a special focus around psychedelics and how we can learn from our psychedelic experiences to have a better life and even to help create a better world. My name is James W. Gesso. I'm the author of two different books on psilocybin mushrooms, and I am your host for this podcast. In each episode, I sit down with a different expert in order to have an unedited, long-form conversation with the goal of providing you, the listener, with a podcast experience that is not just enjoyable and stimulating, but also has value in your life. Whether you are a curious newcomer or a well-informed listener, I am thrilled to have you here on this journey of adventuring through the mind together. Our guest for this episode is Bob Wold from Cluster Busters, and we're going to be talking about cluster headaches and treating cluster headaches with psychedelic tryptamines such as LSD, LSA, and psilocybin, the main psychoactive uh, component of magic mushrooms. As par usual, I've written a bit of an overture to this episode to give you a framework for uh, the show, the content you're about to hear. Uh, You can read along at jameswbgesso.com if you like, or uh, there are timestamps here on YouTube or generally in the show notes to this episode, wherever you're checking out. So you could just jump past this into the interview if you like. Uh, But here we go with the overture. Cluster headaches are a rare and excruciating neurological condition. The term headache even is kind of misleading as what comes to mind when you hear this term is far less extreme than the reality of this condition. Cluster headaches have a subjective pain rating higher than a gunshot wound and some have even described it as the most painful condition known to mankind. They have even been referred to as suicide headaches, as it is common that not only the pain, but the negative impact on one's life is so great that suicide becomes a serious consideration. Unfortunately, cluster headaches are also remarkably difficult to treat. There are some treatment options, from pharmaceuticals to high flow oxygen, and these are somewhat helpful for some people. However, there is no existing reliably effective treatment. That said, there is one form of treatment that many find to be not only extremely helpful, but at this point is the most effective treatment that has been discovered. That's psychedelic tryptamines, such as LSD, LSA, and psilocybin, the active component of magic mushrooms. This is not a new insight arising out of the modern research, but is actually a grassroots discovery made by survivors of cluster headaches more than 20 years ago. A discovery so important that there is a nonprofit organization that was founded explicitly to educate and advocate on the use of psychedelic tryptamines for cluster headache to those with the condition, the public, and to both medical and legal institutions. 
That organization is called Cluster Busters, and today's guest is its founder, Bob Wold. Bob is 69 years old and was diagnosed with cluster headaches approximately 45 years ago, which eventually led to his founding of Cluster Busters in 2002. Cluster Busters was founded on the principles of the need of four psychedelic research proving its benefits as a safe and effective treatment for cluster headaches, which, as we mentioned earlier, is one of the most devastating conditions known to humankind. Cluster Busters first published research on the use of psychedelics to treat cluster headaches back in 2006 is actually the foundation and building block for current psychedelic research into the treatment of pain disorders. Since the founding of Cluster Busters, the organization has grown to be the largest cluster headache support and advocacy nonprofit in the U.S. Bob's work with Cluster Busters has included research projects carried out at institutions such as Harvard, Yale, and the University of West Georgia in the United States, McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and Hanover Hanover Medical School in Hanover, Germany. This research has led to increase and improved treatments for the cluster headache community and is helping advance future treatment improvements as well. Bob Wold joins us here on Adventures Through the Mind podcast to explore what cluster headaches are, their patterns, their symptoms, and pathophysiology, as well as the treatment landscape presently available and a specific deep dive into psychedelic tryptamines as the most effective treatment discovered thus far and how those with clusters are using tryptamines to treat their headaches. Okay, so that's the episode we're going to get into very shortly. First, I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon who make this podcast possible. This podcast is, in fact, brought to you by listeners like you. Without the support of my patrons, this podcast would not exist. So thank you so much. A special thank you to the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode as those uh, individuals give significantly. If you listening are finding value in this podcast, I do ask you to support it financially by becoming a patron on Patreon, which is effectively a way in which you could, you know, offer me a recurring tip once a month in acknowledgement of the value that you experience listening to the show, as well as the efforts and work that I put into producing it for you. If a monthly recurring donation is a bit much for you, you can leave a one-off donation Uh, through PayPal or other options, which are listed in the show notes to this episode. So thank you very much in advance for supporting the show. All right, that's all for the intro. Uh, Please enjoy this episode with Bob Wold, episode 173 here on Adventures Through the Mind. Bob Wold, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Happy to be here, James. Looking forward to this conversation. So, uh, what I want to talk with you about today is tryptamines for the treatment of cluster headaches. This is, uh, it's certainly not new. It's definitely on the fringe end of what people, uh, what people would know about, you know, what psychedelics could offer people mostly. And now it's around mental health essentially. Um, but from what I understand, this treatment protocol has been around for a long time, but before we get into that discussion, I think, it would serve as well to get a sense of what cluster headaches are. So can you start us off by telling us like, what is a cluster headache and how does it differ from what most people might assume the image that they get in their mind when they hear the term headache? Okay. Yeah. Dealing with the term headache is something that we've had to deal with and fight against for many years because it really isn't a headache in the general sense. It's, we like to call it an attack um, because it is really so brutal. Um, the reason they're called cluster headaches is because they come in groups or clusters and then they can go away. 85% of the people with cluster headaches are called episodic, where they'll get a cycle um, or two every year um, and then it goes away completely until the next one starts. And they're pretty much tied to. The calendar, a lot of people start in the spring or in the fall and then either have anywhere from like a six-week to three-month-long cycle where they're going to be getting their number of attacks every day at the same time, usually every day. 
So if your cycle starts on Tuesday and you get an attack at two in the afternoon, you're going to have one at two in the afternoon every day until your cycle ends. So, and so there's good and bad to that. I mean, you can look forward to being in a lot of pain at two o'clock so you can try to get some things done, but then you're looking forward to, and you know what's coming at two o'clock. Um, so it certainly leaves you a bit anxious and getting yourself ready to deal with it. Um, it's a little similar to migraine in that it uh, occurs on one side of the head. Um, some people, they'll switch from cycle to cycle on the right side, one cycle, and the left side, the other cycle, but they normally stay on that side throughout the entire cycle. The attacks last usually between 45 minutes and an hour and a half, but they can last up to three hours. And however long it lasts, it's going to last that long unless you find something to interrupt that. Um, so people can kind of you know plan ahead as far as how long they're going to be out of commission. Um, it's really... People don't like comparing things, but cluster headaches are generally accepted by those physicians that understand what they really are as the most painful condition known to man. Um, I mean, it goes past the point of being in shock, where if somebody was in an accident and their arm was crushed and they kind of go into shock and kind of you know, blocks out a lot of that pain and you're not really sure what's going on. But the pain from cluster headaches, I mean, just zips right past that. And you, so you don't even go into shock. So people you know, normally, um, once it starts and once it's up to its peak, they'll be on their hands and knees, banging their head on the floor, trying to knock themselves out. Or in the shower, banging their heads on the ceramic tile, trying to knock themselves out. And it's impossible to knock yourself out. The pain just keeps you in the moment. And like I said, you know, that pain is going to last for an hour and a half and, and, and then it goes away completely until the next one. Um, there's a little lingering after effects as far as your mental state, but other than that, you know, the pain itself is completely gone. And it's believed to be centered in the hypothalamus and the brain, which is your body clock. So it's really, um, you know, like I said, good and bad that you know when it's going to be happening, but your brain is really setting it off um, at those specific times every day. Um, and um, yeah, we've we've done some. There has been some research done on the level of pain that is involved, and um, people that that took this survey c compared their cluster headaches to other pains syndromes that they've had um no men were comparing you know the pain level of uh the cluster headache to childbirth because they hadn't given birth to anybody but women women have compared it um we had there were 29 people that had actually had a gunshot wound and were able to compare their cluster headache to a gunshot wound and the clusters were scoring in the nines and gunshot wounds were in the six and sevens. So, um, and that included people that had actually survived a suicide attempt and shot themselves in the head. And the, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, they survived and the pain from the gunshot wound wasn't nearly as bad as the cluster headache attack. Wow. So they are, so they are called suicide headaches because the suicide rate is about 20 times the national average. So over the last 25 years, I've lost a lot of friends to cluster headaches. Mm. So. Yeah, it's like I, I was saying in the pre-interview, you know, reading the, your your document uh, that Cluster Busters put out, and I'll ask you more about Cluster Busters later. Um, like reading some of the description and having a sense of like, wow, like a, like a lot of compassion. Like there was a couple moments where I was tearing up because I just felt like, oh my God, what it would be to live with this condition. Um, and yeah, just feeling a lot of, a lot of maybe empathy or compassion for people that are going through it. And again, in the pre, in the pre-interview, I'd mentioned like, 
I could get it, you know, in my mind. I'm like, if that was something that I knew that I was going to be living through for the rest of my life, and it was that bad, you know, the thought of ending my own life would certainly come up, you know, right. because, yeah. Yeah. Suicidal ideation is a, a big part of what we all have to combat against because it certainly enters everybody's mind. Most, most people are diagnosed in their mid twenties. Um, not everybody, but that's the, the, the largest group there. And um, I haven't heard it as much lately, but the doctors used to tell everybody that, well, hopefully you'll outgrow them in your 50s because a lot of people outgrow them in their 50s. They thought, well, I'm 70 years old and I still get my cluster headaches. And I know a lot of people, um, you know, 70, 80, 90, still getting their cluster headaches. And so they've had them for 50 or 60 years. The, the oldest person I ever talked to was cluster headaches <clears throat> and that was interested in trying out psychedelics to treat them was I got a call from a, a woman in Denmark and started um, explaining what was going on. And she was 70 years old and was interested in finding out about psychedelics for treating clusters because her mother, who was 99 years old and in a nursing home, was still surviving with cluster headaches. Wow. So the only the, the oldest person I know that has tried psychedelics to treat her clusters was 99 years old, living in a in a home. So, um, yeah, I think the doctors just tell that to people that gives them some hope that at some point, hopefully they'll outgrow them. Um, sometimes it happens, but uh, most times not. Well, hopefully, you know, not, as the interview will eventually get to, doctors will be able to rely on something that could actually give a sense of hope and not a false one with respect to psychedelics, given the changing landscape of regulation and medicine around them. But before right. we get there, I'd like to ask you a bit more about, you mentioned these clusters. So you said they could come every day at 2 p.m. But when I was reading the um, reading your document, one of the things that I had learned was like, okay, so it could, that could last for like a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and then they'll be gone completely for a period of time. And in the same way that they come back every day at 2 p.m. for a period of time, it might come back every spring or every fall or something to this effect. And that's now, if you could give me a little bit more info about that, and then also sort of weave in there, you know, like, um, the landscape of like, does everyone have it in this way? Do people have one or two sets of clusters and then it goes away or just one? If you give me a little more sense of that. Yeah. Well, everybody is a little bit different. Um, but for the most part, everybody kind of follows the same kind of rules, but everybody's going to be different in what their cluster cycles are like and when they get them and what may work and what may not work for them. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you have a cycle that starts every year in the spring, it's going to start within a couple of days of that date every year. So if your cycle starts April 3rd, you know, you know, when that week is coming up that you're going to have to be ready with, you know, you have your high flow oxygen on hand and ready for it. Then you know that that's going to start and that that cycle for the most part is going to stay the same length of time, whether it's six weeks or seven or eight weeks, whatever it might last. And then it goes away. Some of them, it goes away like snapping your finger and you have it on Tuesday and they're completely gone on Wednesday. Others, it kind of fades away a little bit over like a week where they start getting a little bit better and you start feeling a little better and you can tell that things are changing a little bit and it'll kind of fade away over a week. But yeah, for the most part, People get into a pattern and they stay in that pattern for 45 years. So I, I would normally get a, a cycle every spring that would last three months and every fall that would last three months, no matter what I did. Although I, that changed a lot when I discovered psych, psychedelics treating cluster headaches. Um, so we've been able to, in some cases, completely avoid cycles by dosing a little bit ahead of time because we know when it's going to start so we can take a dose a week or two before that cycle is going to start and that can sometimes completely eliminate that cycle well wait let's let's pa let's pause there because i don't want to get into that yet i really okay. want to flush out like a 
take as much of an understanding about the cluster clusters. headaches first before, sure. before or sorry, the clusters, the attacks first, um, okay. before we get into the psychedelic stuff. Yeah. So, okay. So you say they come on so usually early mid twenties, they last theoretically for the rest of a person's life, which is, you know, like it depends on obviously a lot of factors. Um, and so does that mean that there isn't like a knowledge of any uh specific excuse me um specific uh causes like are there any like specific triggers that are well known um no it, they're very poorly understood because there has been very little research on them over the years um they do believe that it's centered like i said in the hypothalamus in the brain and the body clock and which is good and causes other issues. Um, but they think that something is triggering the brain to send these signals for the pain and they're not sure exactly what it is or why that is. And there's been very little research on determining a cause. And there isn't anything that you can do or not do to stop that cycle from happening. Um, but we all try to figure out what we might when we've done something, if the cycle changes at all, or if even one attack changes at all, we try to figure out if there's something that we did that we could repeat. Um, you know, it, it's like if I don't have my usual 8 p.m. attack and I had spaghetti for dinner that night, I might have spaghetti for dinner for the next three weeks, hoping to repeat that if, if you know, something sure. had happened, yeah. um, which is one of the things that really brings our community together. We all talk because um, patients are the only ones that really understand a lot of these issues that we deal with. And so we share ideas and what might help and what, you know, what we've tried and what doesn't help. And uh, the patient community is really helpful in that way to everybody else in the community. Um, just because it, it is not only very painful, but uh, it really, puts a um, blanket over your, your entire life. So it's really difficult um, holding a job, uh, keeping a relationship together. Um, we did one survey where 30% of the community had lost a relationship with a spouse or had gotten divorced because specifically because of the clusters. Um, and if you add that to the 50-50 split on divorces and marriages that last, that adds up to like 80% chances of you know, your, your relationship not being able to be held together through throughout this because it is really difficult to build a life around cluster headaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even so. I mean, with respect to your, your partner, like your spouse, like, yeah, if, if like every, say, four to six months or once a year, there's three to four months of, of a kind of pain, of a kind of attack that leaves someone completely debilitated screaming in pain that would put a lot of stress on a relationship and my assumption yep. is that especially i mean this is not an issue with the employer so much as it maybe it's an issue of our sort of like socioeconomic landscape uh but i can't imagine most employers would be like yeah cool i know that you know like a couple of times a year or once a year you might have four months where you're just like not really working most of the time and right. so thumbs up that's fine we'll keep paying you yes right yeah yeah it's really difficult and it takes a while for most of us to settle into earning some type of, of a living you know a lot of a lot of us work for ourselves so that we can kind of be our own boss and hopefully have some kind of a business where decisions can can wait until you're done with your pain and you can make your way to your laptop or and work from home. Um, and just that trying to keep a job makes life difficult on people. I mean, even if they want to uh, travel somewhere for a treatment or get into a clinical study, it's like, it took me 10 years to find a job that I can work at and they understand my clusters. I can't take two weeks off to go to Connecticut for a, a headache study. I just can't do it because I'll lose my job and I don't know if I'll be able to get another one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it puts an awful lot of strain on families. I always like to say that 
you know, one person doesn't get clusters, the entire family gets clusters and they all have to deal with it. And everybody with clusters, I mean, one of the things that we do is immediately try to isolate ourselves so that nobody can see us going through that pain. Mm-hmm. So a lot of, there's nothing uh, they can do to help you anyways. There, right. There's yeah. nothing that they can do. And, um, you know, one of the biggest fears people with clusters has is not their own clusters, but if they start having kids, they start thinking, I could never, I, I don't know what I would do watching my child go through cluster headaches. It, it's a terrible fear for people. Um, I know a lot of people don't get married. A lot of people don't have kids just because of you know these family issues that, that would come up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you certainly don't feel like you're contributing to the family like you should be. Mm-hmm. Or you um, feel like you should be. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's pretty difficult on, on families. So the community is very tight and very supportive of each other. And um, we love our caregivers. You know, a lot of them don't stick around. And that's, I think, the normal thing to do. It's like, this is no life to, to build a family around. And, you know, everybody agrees with that. You know, I think the person with the clusters is just as likely to be the one to end a relationship just because they don't feel like they're in it and are, you know, more of a drag on the relationship than they should be. So the ones that stick around, the caregivers that stick around are really something special for all of us because we know how difficult it is. Mm. And and your your mention there about the community, it would make sense, you know, like because the way that you described it, you describe sort of like this headache as a misnomer. Um, I imagine that most most people, nearly all people, I will say maybe everyone who has not had an attack doesn't really understand how bad it can be unless they've been in the room and watched the person getting to the point that they are banging their head against the wall, screaming in pain. Right. Um, but yeah, especially too with the degradation of relationships, et cetera, to think about going through that is bad enough, you know, but then to go through it completely alone is a whole other thing. And to have a community of others, even in the moment of the attack, like some level, my assumption is like, you know, going into it and coming out of it, like you're not the only one that's going through this and you have supportive community who actually get it, um, right. would make a huge difference, especially given your comment about the suicide rates. Yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, there was a, a big difference when the internet became available to everybody and c- people could actually make contact with somebody else that had cluster headaches. You know, most neurologists and doctors are only going to see one or two patients with clusters in their careers. Um, so, so most people with clusters, unless they're, they've found the community, they've never met anybody else with cluster headaches. And trying to explain cluster headaches is really difficult. I mean, there are no words to describe what you go through with the pain levels and and how clusters affect you. So you're trying to explain something to somebody that has never gone through it with words that don't exist. It's just impossible. So when people find this community and know that they're talking to somebody that understands the pain level and, and the life that uh, we lead, it, it's really um, an emotional moment. I mean, we have conferences every year where you know, people walk into a room, uh, you know, maybe they've never met anybody with clusters before and they've spent the last 20 years trying to explain them to family members or whomever. And they can walk into a room with 200 people that you don't need to explain yourself to at all. It's a life-changing experience to to have that happen and finally find somebody that understands and you don't need to try to explain yourself of why you haven't been to work in three months because of a headache. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and 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 the the sense of no longer being alone. Yeah, yeah, it's it's huge. Um, and yeah we've talked a little bit about suicide and it, it it's always a big topic and we deal with a lot of people that come to us you know with those thoughts in their head and um, reach out to the community and um, are able to at least find somebody they can talk to mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I would, I mean, obviously, to me, uh, when I think about this, and there's a number of other scenarios in my mind, you know, I, I like suicide on some level is a strategy that will work to address this very specific thing. It's just the costs of that are just so great that it needs to be like, yeah. So in my mind, it's like being able to get to a place, oh, oh sorry, talking to someone really helps because a lot of the times it's the talking to someone and getting care that can help sort of contextualize how great that cost is and sort of help sort of soften the decision making of like moving towards that as your option. But yet then add in this complexity of like, unless you've had a cluster headache, you don't understand. Then even talking to somebody who is like suicide prevention, skilled in mental health and so on and so forth would only get a person with cluster headache so far, I assume. And being right. able again to reach out into a community of people that you know, like you're not alone, like they get it. And when they give you the encouragement to hang on, you know, like that can really, I have my assumption it would, it would land much more strongly than than anybody else. Yeah, it, it makes a big difference. And, you know, until we got involved with talking to the people at our national suicide prevention network that the government has out there and, you know, call this number if you're feeling suicidal, um, we, we contacted them and they had never even heard of cluster headaches. And none of their operators were trained and how to handle somebody that had cluster headaches and and would call it that number. And at that point, I mean, if you don't understand them, these people are calling somebody that it's like, you're the 100th person I've tried to explain this to, that you, know, you don't understand what they are. And it would be talking to an operator and who would say, oh yeah, I, I get migraine, they're really bad, I, I, I know what you're going through, or yeah, I had a really bad headache, you know, a month ago because of this or that. And, you know, I know what you're feeling. And and that's the worst thing that they can hear. It's like, no, it, at least admit you don't understand what I'm going through. <laughs> um, so we helped them build a training module for, for their operators so that at least they didn't say the wrong things when these people were, were calling in. Because finding somebody that knows what it is that you're trying to explain to them is a huge deal for people in our community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and with that said, like kudos to those people who are doing that work, you know, like, unfortunately they might accidentally be causing harm out of ignorance because of a lack of training, but uh, like, it makes sense. Okay. Like relate with the person on the call, help them feel seen, help them feel connected. And it's, yeah, it's nice to know that there have been protocols put in place to make it so that they're, you know, their good intentions and in other circumstances, effective engagement doesn't accidentally cause more harm. Right. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was a big deal for us as a community to, to, you know, help them make those changes. So it was, um, it was some of the good work that our advocates have done. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask just a couple more questions about the i think the term i'm looking for is pathophysiology um because coincidentally uh one of my favorite uh podcaster scientists andrew huberman recently released an episode about headaches and treating headaches and there's a couple of sections there in cluster headaches not really going too deeply into it um but one of the things that he had mentioned and I believe was also in your uh, documentation was around the trigeminal nerve, inflammation of the trigeminal nerve. And you had also just mentioned something about the um, hypothalamus. So what role does the trigeminal nerve play? I know that you said that you don't know what the cause is in the, right. the hypothalamus. There's an association, but maybe a little bit more on that. Yeah. Well, yes, the, the hypothalamus is sending signals to the trigeminal nerve to create this pain um, and turning it on and turning it off. And yes, the trigeminal nerve is involved and which unfortunately leads to a lot of misdiagnosis because of the nerve, um, which comes down the side of your face and goes into your jaw and into your, your teeth. So most people with clusters in the first few years while they're being misdiagnosed, 
end up going to a, da- a, a dentist because th- they feel the pain all the way down into their teeth and they think that the pain is starting there and working its way up. So they end up having four teeth pulled. I've talked to people that have had all their teeth pulled before they got a, a proper diagnosis. It's like, no, the pain isn't starting in your jaw and it, under your teeth. That's just where the trigeminal nerve ends. So it comes, the, the pain is usually centered around the uh, temple area. Um, a lot a lot of times you can kind of feel it starting with some pressure in the back of your neck and kind of coming up the side of your head. But it's really centered on the temple and behind the eye. And it's a terrible pressure where you feel like it's trying to push your eyeball out. And there have been a lot of accounts where people have actually gouged their eye out with a spoon. Oh, my God. Trying, trying to relieve that pressure. Because honestly, you feel like if you had a, just a drill and you drilled a hole in your in your temple, you could relieve the pressure. The pressure is just immense. And you just feel like it's going to explode. So you try to figure out a way how to relieve that pressure. So, yeah, people have um, gouged their eyes out trying to relieve that pressure. Um, but, yeah, the trigeminal nerve is the one that is involved um, and can cover a pretty large area on the side of the face and side of the head. Mm. Um, could I get you, I think you knocked your mic. Could I get you to pull it out? Maybe like two or three centimeters, like a, Oh, that's, that, that's going to be way too far. Maybe. Okay. That, so, yeah, that's better. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the actual sort of root cause not known. Um, right. But the sort of like the consequences on the trigeminal nerve, trigeminal nerve are that it inflames, it creates these symptoms. So right. now let's get into treatment because the way that you're describing this, it sounds really intense. And it also, one might, you know, assume based on the way that you're describing it, that there aren't any effective treatments. Cause if there were, you wouldn't be on here talking about how awful it is and how it ruins people's lives and leads to suicide because there'd be a treatment. So can you give us a little sense of the sort of treatment landscape right now? What doesn't work, but people might assume could work as well as what has been found to work everything other than tryptamines. Okay. Um, well, there, there are two classes of drugs, um, abortives, which you would take to try to end that attack or that headache um, and preventives that people take to try to minimize the number of attacks or prevent the attacks from happening. Um, None of them work really well other than a couple in some instances. Um, The first 20 years of my life with cluster headaches, I, I had been on 70 different medications like in, not all at once, just like not over all the at course once. of yeah, seventy different in hundreds of um, variations, and um, you know, been on four at a time, five at a time. I came out of the hospital once with fifteen different prescriptions. Wow! Um, but very rarely would anything really work. Um, it may seem like it's working for a week or two and then your body kind of just adjusts and it's um, right back to where you started again. So most doctors just, you know, there's a list of drugs that they can you know, prescribe and it really just gets us out of their office for a month. You know, here, try this, see if this helps and come back and see me in a month. And, you know, you get a new prescription, it gives you a little bit of hope that maybe this will help and then a month later you're back and you know let's try something else and that'll get you through that that little bit of hope that you get can get you through that three months where nothing's really working but you've got a little bit of hope that something is going to be helpful the best abortive that we have is high flow oxygen and it's taken out of a you need a, a tank not a concentrator and you really need to try to hyperventilate on 100 percent oxygen we have we've designed our own mask for clusters um which produces 100 percent oxygen um and 
people that have that access, uh, oftentimes they can end their you know 45 minute attack in 10 minutes instead of 45 minutes. But they need to get on it as quickly as possible, and it needs to be high flow, and um, they need to be able to have access to be able to get to it right away because the longer the attack has been going on, the harder it is to abort with, with oxygen. So the ones that wake you up in the middle of the night, you're already in a full blown attack. So it takes a little bit longer for the oxygen to take effect, but we're still at a point where a lot of doctors don't want to prescribe oxygen. They don't understand it. They don't understand why it would work They're They have some fear that it might cause some damage. Um, if you have a doctor that will prescribe it, then you, at least in the U.S., you hope that your insurance company will cover it, and a lot of them won't. Um, and and trying to find a, a supplier that'll give you enough oxygen tanks to get you through your cycle is sometimes difficult. So we run into a lot of difficulties being able to get the one thing that's really works well and can be life saving. Um, and people just run into a lot of issues trying to get that and. You know, a lot of doctors don't know to even write a prescription for it, that it works. I mean, they, they just don't know. So people can go 10 or 20 years with clusters and not know that this one thing could really help them. It won't stop attacks and it won't end your cycle, but you can treat the attacks and hopefully get them over with more quickly. Um, there are a lot of different preventives that have been tried. Most of those are hand-me-downs from um, either other headaches like migraine or blood pressure medications. Um, they try to come at it from a lot of different ways. Um, really depends on what kind of a doctor you go to see. You know, they're going to use their expertise and prescribe, you know, antidepressants or you know, wh whatever it might be that they think they've had some luck with previous patients. Um, so yeah, just about anything that people have tried for headache, um, people with clusters end up trying somewhere along the line. Um, there had never been a medication that was approved specifically for clusters that went through FDA trials and got approved um, until a few years ago. Eli Lilly got um, a medication called Emgality, which is a CGRP, which, which it, it it blocks some of the signals that are supposedly happening to trigger the attacks. Um, and th this was the first medication that ever went through phase three studies and that a company actually wrote the check for that kind of research to happen. Um, and it is helping a lot of people with clusters. There are some super responders. It's a once a month injection. Um, because they did this, the studies, they actually found out that clusters needed three times as much as a migraine patient needed. So we had to train doctors to make sure that they wrote the prescription for clusters and that um, they were getting the proper dosage. But yeah, there are some super responders that take these injections and it really works really well. Um, but they need to keep on taking those injections until their cycle is over. Um, but it is once a month injection. Other people get various levels of relief from it. Um, some of them, it doesn't help at all. But once again, at least it's something that um, the community knows that at least somebody tried to find something that would work specifically for clusters. Mm. I, I can um, imagine that from a, a funding perspective, given, you know, there are a lot of people that have cluster headaches from what I'm hearing, but it's not a huge percentage of the population. And then there's issues of like, well, how this sucks, but how profitable of a drug is this going to be? Right. Like, why would we bother investing in this drug to help people if we're not going to make money off of it? And then there's like, yeah. And then will the insurance companies even pay for it? Like there's all these sort of like, as again, I spoke backwards to the, previously to the socioeconomic landscape or context that makes it so that, you know, maintaining a job and the, and the necessities of jobs and such can be compromised by, by, um, the cluster headaches. I could see how, 
again, that same sort of socioeconomic system will make it so that like, why, you know, mo- most people aren't going to put whatever a hundred million dollars, uh, you know, uh, in goodwill towards like development of a drug, not feeling like they're going to profit off of it. So right. I could see why there wouldn't have been a lot of research and there wouldn't have been a lot of development. Yeah. I, it's a big thing that we've dealt with over the last 20 years and in, in fighting that. And, and it, there's really a lot of different levels where you know, the numbers of people with cluster headaches really comes into play as a detriment. It's like, I'm really glad there aren't, you know, 20 million people suffering from this. But, you know, in the U.S., there's, you know, we think there's about 350,000 of us in the U.S., although there really aren't any great demographic studies that have been done in years. Uh, But we kind of think that that's what the number is. Um, On one hand, that, that puts us almost twice the amount of people that um, are needed for orphan drug status, which makes things a lot easier to get through FDA and a lot lot cheaper and a lot quicker. So so there aren't enough of us for orphan drug status, but because we are so spread out, a lot of doctors, even if they had an idea, would have a difficult time filling a large study to try to get, you know, 350 people with cluster headaches into their site to get into a study was really thought to be impossible because they just, you know, like I said, most doctors only see one or two patients in their lifetime. And it is difficult getting us into a study um, where the sites are. So even those that wanted to study it and research it didn't think that they could fill a, a, you know, phase two or phase three study. And, um, so the internet once again has helped out bring the community together to show you know we are out here and we will fill a study if you if you do something. Um, but yeah, I mean it's really difficult convincing somebody to write that big check for phase one, two, and three study for cluster headaches. It's like you know if we finally find something that works for them, how much are we going to have to charge for this treatment? Um, especially in the case that, you know, they're only going to be using my medication maybe six weeks out of the year, you know, and <clears throat> most preventives are taken every day. Um, abortives are taken when the attack comes on, but, you know, so they're looking at a, a fairly small patient group that doesn't need their medication for, you know, half the year. So that cut, cuts it down even more. Um, as far as whether or not they can, they think they can get their money back for their mm-hmm. investment. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and and again, like that 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 goes into the you know the problematic structure we have around you know like drug development as a as a profit industry, similar to I mean similar but different, but like housing and real estate as a profit industry. It's like things that are you know things that are sort of like foundation for human health you know, shouldn't be thing, in my opinion, shouldn't be things that are oriented around like profit, right? Right. That, that, you know, like food, housing, medicine. I get that. I understand the sort of capitalism competition breeds sort of advancement and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm not denying that that is on certain levels true, but only within the, only within a, you know, a scenario where, the sort of like striving to outcompete will result in the acquisition of a greater of, of profit margin. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so not let's not go down that train too much further. Um, but I do have a couple questions because you know you mentioned like basically there's nothing that seems to help. High flow oxygen during an attack can sort of shorten it down if you get to it quickly. There's this injection that seems to be really helpful for some people kind of helpful for most people not helpful at all for others um and that's a big advancement uh there are two things that i read uh that in your in your documentation that that had some some uh seemingly positive benefit for some people i'll ask you about in a second but first i want to just confirm because i think for the average listener the assumption is like okay so pain it's a pain signal so why don't you just use a drug to cut out the pain so 
opiates, uh, opiates, ketamine, um, and SADs of any variety. But from what I understand, none of these actually work. Is that correct? For the most part, you're correct that they, they don't work. Uh, um, if you're going to use an opiate, number one, it would have to be very fast acting. So you would need an injection. Um, you, you can't take a pill to treat that pain because it just takes too long to get into the system and start working. But opiates, I, I, while p- a lot of people are getting misdiagnosed, they end up getting you know on the list to get, you know, well, let's try pain medication, let's try opiates. So most people do end up trying them, but they just don't work at, at all, just because the pain level is, is way out there. And um, you know, I know that at least they used to still use heroin as a pain treatment in Europe in a lot of places. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if there was some sort of a pain injection, probably heroin might be strong enough to do it, but you certainly don't, can't be getting, you know, eight injections of heroin a day to treat your eight attacks a day. Sure. And I, I imagine um, it'd be hard pressed for a doctor to prescribe at home intravenous heroin, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, to use as needed. Uh, right, right, right. Use as needed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was actually prescribed, uh, um, liquid cocaine, wow. um, probably 30 years ago. So I was getting a prescription of, uh, an eyedropper with cocaine in it um to put in the same eye that would be a part of the the side of the head it would, that was, it would, it would be dropped in, into the nasal passage you put your head back okay. and there's a nerve ganglion in the back of your um gull that um taps into that trigeminal nerve so if you can deaden that nerve from that spot um it can be helpful um but the, Cocaine was really kind of replaced as that kind of a treatment with lidocaine. Lidocaine will really pretty much do the same thing that cocaine would do. Um, so there are some people that use lidocaine drops. Um, but once again, while you're going through a terrible attack, um, the last thing you want to do is lay down on a bed and put your hang your head over the edge of the bed um, and try to you know get an eyedropper into your into your nose and lay there for 10 minutes. People with clusters do not lay down. Um, they make you get up and start pacing and walking um, and or running. Um, but laying down does certainly not help. It makes it worse. So, um, so a, that type of a treatment really doesn't play well into treating clusters um, yeah it's like th- theoretically it works but practically it doesn't yeah, yeah yeah and and that's what you know our community has really been able to do over the last 25 years is kind of let doctors know what the real world practice is and what is working and what isn't working um because you know if they only see one or two patients and they give them a prescription and the patient doesn't come back they think the prescription worked well, it either didn't work and you didn't know what you were doing, so they found a different doctor, or the person's cycle stopped and they don't need any more, you know, attempts and any more prescriptions. Sure. For that for for the rest of that year, perhaps. Right, for the rest of that year. So then they'll either go back to the same doctor um or find a new one. Um yeah. I was misdiagnosed for four years in the very beginning. Um I thought that um Initially, they thought it was a sinus infection, and I went on some pretty strong medications to s- treat that, and my cycle ended. So we thought, well, that's what it was. So then six months later, it happened again, so I went back to the same doctor, and it's, it's like, God, this infection is back. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, and, it's a chronic uh, recurring uh, infection. Or, yeah. Right. So we tried treating it the same way, and it didn't work at all, and I had gotten there early on in my cycle. So... You know, I was on medication long enough to know that it wasn't helping. So we, it must be something else. So at one point, I ended up at a, a, a dentist having root canals and teeth pulled and thinking that that's what it was. And uh, <clears throat> after we had pulled the teeth and the pain was still there, my dentist recommended I go to a chiropractor. 
So I went to a chiropractor, explained what I was going through, and he said, oh, I can get this taken care of within three or four visits. We'll get you taken care of. And he's like, and then he said, and if I can't, then you've probably got a brain tumor and it should get it checked out. So I'm like, hmm, all right, well, I hope that you can fix this. So after three or four treatments, it, it was worse. So then I'm thinking, well, I guess I've got a brain tumor. So I went in and had a, went to my doctor, begged for a CAT scan, had a CAT scan. He came into the room I was in and said, well, I've got great news. You don't have a brain tumor. And it was like, that really isn't great news. Yeah, because now you like, don't know what it is. You may you may think that it's great news, but I'm going through hell, and you don't you can't tell me why. Uh, what am I looking at? I, it just it's like that's not good news. It, at least if I had a brain tumor, I would know what we needed to do to try mm -hmm. to fix it. Yeah, but you, we're you still at feel ground so zero. Yeah, right, right, powerless and hopeless even. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about too, like, I don't know what the situation was for you, but my assumption in the United States is like, if you need a band aid, you're getting a, a bill for $6,000. Um, right. so, right. and what, like kind of like public, public health insurance only came out during the Ob Obama era. And from what I understand, even that's not really all that reliable. Right. Um, but let's just, let's just leave that conversation aside. Two things. And then I want to get straight into tr to psychedelics two right. things that i thought were interesting that you said seemed to help stop an attack which was high doses of caffeine very quickly and aerobic exercises um can you give us a just a sh very short vignette on those two and how, sort of like why you think they might work or how they work yeah um well once again we don't know why they work but um what like I described people in an attack, they can't lay down. They need to be up and moving. And some people have found that um, extensive exercise really quickly um, can release whatever chemicals it releases in the body that can end an attack really quickly. It doesn't work for the majority of people or really you know, large numbers of people, but it's something that some people have found for them, it, it can end an attack a, a little bit earlier. Um, plus, you know, it gives them something to do other than, you know, suicidal thoughts while they're going through this or banging their head on the floor. Um, people start, you know, jogging or running or running up and down the stairs in their home or something like that, uh, lifting weights. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people do try that. Um, same with caffeine, um, at our conferences, the, the big, biggest thing that people ask about is to make sure there's a coffee shop in the hotel because we all drink massive amounts of coffee for the caffeine. Um, caffeine is kind of known to speed up, um, uh, medications that people take and get it into the system quicker. Um, and you know, that's why you know, there's caffeine and a lot of analgesics and, and other things because it gets into the system quicker. So the caffeine seems to speed up whatever it is, whatever process there is to get to the end of the attack. It speeds things up a little bit. Um, nobody knows why or what the basis of that is because you know, once again, there's just very little research on it. Um, but it's just one of those things that the community has found that, um, we all share in, um, loving our coffee. Okay. Let's get, let's get into tryptamines. I also love my coffee, but for different yeah. reasons. Um, <laughs> so let's get into tryptamines or well, uh, okay. you know, psychedelics. Cause I understand there are tryptamine type compounds that have been previously used as a kind of medication with varying, uh, efficacy, but, um, yeah, so your whole cluster busters seems to focus quite specifically on utilizing tryptamine based psychedelics for the treatment of cluster headaches from what i understand both breaking a cycle and ending or or softening an attack can you give us a sense of the landscape of of or not the landscape like where to where does psychedelic tryptamines fit inside of 
cluster headache treatment. Okay. Well, you know, we, we started this 25 years ago, doing, looking into tryptamines. And you know, there are now thousands or tens of thousands of people that are treating their cluster headaches um, worldwide um, by themselves and getting better treatment with, with psychedelics than anything that their doctor ever prescribed for them. And most of the treatments that people use when a doctor would prescribe at a molecular level are really close to psychedelics. And so if a doctor or researcher kind of looks at the molecule, they can understand why it might be helpful. Um, when LSD was discovered, Dr. Hoffman was working with ergotamines, um, which is one of the treatments that people have used for hundreds of years to treat headache disorders. Um, so that, that kind of, you know, was a natural, you know, discovery there, you know, and the molecule is very similar to things that do also work um, that don't cause hallucinations. And, you know, people have been able to get prescriptions for a lot of things that are are helpful, but are very close on a molecular level to psychedelics. Um, and yeah, I mean, once again, th this was a discovery by the community itself. Um, I said we were at early stages of message boards back then, and we had a young guy from Scotland that came to the message board and wanted to share an idea that he had because his cluster headache cycle didn't start in the fall like it had started the previous eight or 10 years or whatever it was. And we always try to figure out what it was that we might have done differently to cause either a cycle to change or an attack to change. And the only thing that he could figure out that he had done differently was he had done some recreational LSD at some concerts over the summer. And his normal fall cycle did not start. So he did a little bit of research on it, and there had been some studies back in the 50s and 60s on treating pain with LSD. <clears throat> so he was just basically kind of asking the question, you know, has anybody heard anything about this possibly helping? Um, a lot of people were you know, really skeptical about, you know, why are you here asking about LSD? We're, you know, here treating a medical condition. But a few of us were really interested in it and did a little bit of research and saw those same similarities to a lot of the medications that we were being prescribed. Um, and we couldn't, LSD is still really difficult to gain access to. So, you know, none of us had access to LSD. Um, very few of us had ever done any psychedelics in our lives at that point. Um, and, but, it was a little bit intriguing, so some of us decided to um, research what was close to LSD and found that psilocybin mushrooms um, were, were very close to LSD. It's kind of the natural LSD. Um, so some people started growing their own mushrooms and took some doses and had excellent results with treating their cluster cycles better than anything that they had ever been prescribed before. Um, so some of us kind of stayed on it and kept on doing more research and tried to get some people interested in asking questions. And I, in the early days, I mean, I couldn't even get a doctor to return an email if it had the word psilocybin in it or LSD. Sure, of course, yeah. They, did, they didn't want to put their name on any document that included those words. They just wouldn't even respond. Um, but at the same time that all those discussions were going on, I went in to see my doctor, um, who had properly diagnosed me. And the first thing he said was, after he said hello, was if I could write you a prescription for psilocybin, I would write you the prescription right now because I understand why it would work. And it's, I, I understand why these discussions are going on. So like I said, I mean, if, if scientists look at the molecule, they can understand at least the connection to other th treatments that do work. Um, so that's what kind of built Cluster Busters. We were building a community, and this was one of the things that we found that 
really seemed to be helping people. And so the big thing was tackling the research and, and finding out whether or not it really did work. And if so, how do we get this to people? Um, you know, most people don't want to put anything in their body that hasn't been approved by the FDA or approved by our government who you know, knows better. So, you know, if the FDA approved it, then it must be safe and it must work. Um, so that, that's what really got us involved in the research was because there was very little research on clusters at all. And we thought that this was one that really deserved to be researched. And our first paper was published out of Harvard in 2006 um, that showed pretty positive results with using psilocybin and LSD to treat clusters. Hmm. Um, so what is like, <clears throat> is, is like given the whole sort of situation with all the different medications that have tried and failed their pros and cons are the trip to me based psychedelics, the sort of the most reliable and the most re- effective that you found at this point? Yes the most effective and most reliable. I mean, people have been using them now for 20 years and they're still effective. The really good thing about it is that you don't need to use it all the time. This is not something that you take every day. Um, So the effectiveness isn't going to be lost by, by using it the number of times that we end up needing it. Um, There was actually a medication that was pretty successful in treating cluster headaches for people. It was called methasergide. The brand name was uh, Sansert. And it was the FDA's way of approving a, a psychedelic because they had really butchered the molecule and added a lot of things to the molecule that they thought was blocking the psychedelic effects. <clears throat> um, And it did do a good job of blocking the psychedelic effects. But this was a pill that you needed to take every day. Oh, God. And it was so it was was more of a preventive. um, And it did work for a lot of people. And it wasn't real expensive. And it was used for some other things also. Um, But it went to certain receptors that could cause problems. And if you stayed on it for too long, um, your soft tissue organs um, could be damaged and um, fibrosis would set in and your lungs or your heart you know, turns into a, you know, a, a hardened mass. Um, so a lot of doctors didn't like prescribing it when they realized some of the side effects um, of it. But it turned out that if you took a break like for a month, you could go back onto it again without these side effects. Um, but it really didn't catch on as something that was being prescribed a lot for clusters, even though it probably was the best treatment out there because it was the closest to um, psychedelics. Um, but then it got pulled from the market in the U.S. The company that was making it decided not to sell it in the U.S. anymore. It was available in Canada and some other areas for a while, but probably within a year or so, it just became unavailable. The manufacturer just stopped making it. My assumption um, is because it was no longer profitable, but maybe I'm being jaded. Right. Yeah. No, I'm I'm sure that's what it was because it was you know it wasn't being prescribed a lot for the people that could use it, and um, yeah. So you're talking about a small patient base to begin with, and you know the doctor's not like liking to write those prescriptions. Um, it just became you know a financial decision. I'm sure. Mm. And I and coming back to psychedelics, you know, now what you're saying is there's something that you could. I'm I'm thinking about the the late great Kalindi E. Yi, his comment about mushrooms being like you could grow enough in your closet for your whole family for generations, and in, in you know like in a handful of months. Uh, so it's like with respect to that, there's like this greater access that's available to people even with the psychedelic effects. Can right. you give me a better sense of? the i mean okay you say that it's effective like how effective is it like okay i'm gonna eat a gram of mushrooms and my cluster headaches over or like i'm coming up to uh coming up to my yearly cycle you know i'm gonna take a like 100 200 micrograms of lsd and then the cycle won't start or like i guess this is a question of like 
dosage, efficacy, and protocol. Yeah. So this was really something that we've developed um, within the community, um, sharing information and trying to figure out what dose worked the best for people, um, how often they needed to dose, when they could dose. Um, and we've really been collecting that data for 20 years and kind of refined the, the treatment protocol. Um, and everybody is a little bit different, just like with any other medication. Some people need a bigger dose of, you know, an anti-seizure med than other people need. Um, so people need to kind of determine themselves what their best dose is. And one thing about mushrooms really kind of lets you tune in on your body and um, you're a little bit more aware of what's going on and you can really make some really good decisions on dosing. You certainly know more than anybody else knows about whether or not you should increase the dose or decrease the dose. Um, and we start out with a pretty low dose. Um, it's usually between a gram and a gram and a half of dried mushrooms for a dose. Um, some people have success even with a lower dose. Um, most people don't have a lot of success increasing the dose. And a lot of people have tried because a lot of people think that well, my clusters are really bad. I'm in a really bad place. I don't want to wait for three doses of this. I, I'd like to hope maybe one dose could do it if I triple the dose. So a lot of people have tried larger doses, and it really isn't productive at all. Mm. Um, As in, it, it's it, it it's not such that uh, a little bit works and more works better. It's correct. Yeah, it, yeah. So finding the, the lowest dose that works is really important, and people are able to do that. And, you know, if, if this is something that they're going to be doing on a regular basis, you know, it's not something that's really enjoyable. You know, it's it's like, here I go again. I'd, I'd rather not sit down and read a book for six hours. You know, I'd rather be doing something else. This is not enjoyable at all. And it's, you know, medicine. Um, but most people get really good results. And... um in all sorts of different ways. Like I still would get my two cycles every year, one in the fall and one in the, in the spring. But a lot of people take maintenance doses in between their cycles, just, just usually one dose. So it worked out perfect for me that my maintenance doses, if I was going to take one in between my cycles, uh, worked out for the 4th of July and New Year's Eve. I could take those, <laughs> I could take those doses. They're six months apart. And right in the middle of where my cycles would start. Um, right. But you don't enjoy it, right? <laughs> well, those Sorry, doses, I, I, laugh those this, doses I try to enjoy. Yeah. Um, and I'm fairly you know, well known in the community I, I live in. I, I know a lot of people here. And we used to have fireworks every year on the 4th of July. And um, a lot of the people I knew knew how I was treating my cluster headaches and they were, they were really happy that I found something that worked. So the whole town would go out to watch the 4th of July fireworks and I'd sit there with my family and my lawn chair and my headphones listening to the Pink Floyd. <laughs> and I'd have, you know... Hopefully not the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty dark. And, um, yeah. So I'd have, you know, friends of mine and police officers and and all that you know coming by to high five me because they knew how i was treating my oh that's my really clusters. cool yeah yeah it, it was and i had a lot of support in in the community that i'm in um which was really helpful but um so people taking these maintenance doses are able to completely avoid some cycles i mean wow. they can take it you know either you know it, certain in intervals or because they know when their cycle is going to start, if it's going to start on, you know, April 15th, you know, they may take that dose a week before that, you know, the first week in April, they'll take a dose. And then if the cycle is still, you feel it coming on, then you can take another dose and, and hopefully put that cycle to sleep completely within, you know, a couple of days of it starting. Um, other people start, treating you know after their cycle has already begun the quicker they do it the better off 
you know, they're going to be and the better the results are going to be. Um, but everybody's different. I mean, it depends on, you know, what kinds of medications and how much they've used over the last 40 years that may have ch changed their you know body chemistry um, in ways that we don't understand. Um, there are a lot of medications that people use that will block the effects of the psychedelics. They, they use the same neurotransmitters and receptors. Um, um, so if you're, you're blocking the receptors with some medications and the psychedelics aren't going to work at all. So mm. a lot of them have to stop medications that they've been using. Sure. You're um, talking about like antidepressant medications, like the, if they're on uh, escitalopram or, or something like yeah. this, that, that it's not going to work for them. Like it's they're not going to have the same benefits. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we've really developed a whole list that's been put together by the community of, you know, which medications you need to stop and how, how, Soon before the treatment, uh, do you need to stop so that the psychedelic treatment works the best? Hmm. I wonder uh, if you, uh, if your, if Cluster Busters has any uh, knowledge or involvement with um, spirit pharmacist Benjamin Malcolm. He's been putting out very extensive guides on antidepressant and psychedelic interactions. He's a pharmacist and no. uh, tap tapering protocols and like specific t protocols to make sure that you're optimizing for. The be positive benefits of uh, psychedelics. So, if you're not already tuned into that that guy, that organization, I imagine okay. his work would be in service to Cluster Buster's work as well. Yeah, it would be. I'll follow up on that for sure. Cool. Um, is it, yeah, I mean that's just more that we need to learn about um, how to make these treatments work the best as possible. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? Do you have any sense of of the? Like of why I know you don't even really have a strong sense of why the cluster headaches happen at all, but is there like right off the bat, my mind's like, maybe it's a neural inflammation thing. Like something about, I understand tryptamine based psychedelics tend to have a pretty, you know, broad sense of like, yeah, it reduces neural inflammation. Right. It, do you have a sense of like what it might be about these, these molecules that's helping to create this benefit? Um, we, we don't know. And there's been a lot of, you know, talk about, you know, what is really going on here. Um, and um, we think that it's changing the way the gene, your genes are expressing themselves. And it tells your genes to stop expressing cluster headaches and just start acting normal again. So, oh, so you're suggesting that there's like, um, there's a, I guess, since you have to keep doing it, it's, it's temporary, but sort of a, like an epigenetic nudge correct interesting right. right that's really you know topic that i've talked to a lot of the researchers on and that's really kind of one of interest to, to all of us that it's, it's an epigenetic effect that's taking place mm. and, and do you have a sense of what the that it, whether or not there's a specific genetic variant that is associated with cluster headaches it's like that's known there aren't any known. We've tried getting some of that research done, and we got one project started up at the McGill in Canada, um, but it it really just couldn't take off. I mean, it was difficult finding people and and getting them to turn in genetic samples and and DNA, and um, it was just really difficult. I mean, so it's kind of on hold. That was something that we had been working on, but. There really hasn't been much research in that area yet, but it, it certainly needs to be. And you know, I, I really think that that's where we're going to get some answers. Hmm. So. Uh, so, yeah. So you'd mentioned, um, yeah, you gave you gave a sense of the sort of dosing protocol. I mean, for people who want to follow up and get more information about that, either for their own curiosity or because they're, I assume, anyone with cluster headaches has already you know, unless they just got one, like yeah. in the last year or so, they probably already are aware of the, of the work that your organization is doing. Um, but I'll leave people to go into like reading the actual document and the, the, the materials documentation you have on your website for this kind of information. Um, right. but I do have a couple more questions. Uh, one of which is like in your in the documentation you talk about psilocybin and then various plant sources of LSA and LSA extraction. Have right. you found like, of course, pe people are going to be talking about on the message forums or whatever they could, whoever's got access to whatever they're going to try 
that rather than going out of the way for something else. But do you find there's like a, a diff a different difference in efficacy between say psilocybin, LSA, LSD, DMT? Because I know DMT is obviously also a tryptamine. Um, right. Anything anything there? Yeah, well, there certainly are differences, and um, the way we discovered that LSA might be a, a treatment was it, it used to be legal to buy psilocybin mushrooms in, in England and a lot of people with cluster headaches were hopping on their bike and riding down to their local shop and buying the mushrooms they needed to treat their cluster headaches and then there was an election in England Tony Blair was re-elected on a strong anti-drug crusade and and made psilocybin mushrooms illegal in the UK. So all of these people that were treating their their clusters no, could no longer get their mushrooms. So there were a lot of people that were in a really panic mode. And um, there was a nurse in Denmark, her husband had clusters, and he had been using mushrooms, but he really couldn't get over to, the last 10% of the hurdle to, to treat his, his clusters. They were much better, but he just couldn't break the cycle. So she ended up doing some research and discovered LSA seeds and the close connection and the molecular level for those. And so she ordered some seeds online and she treated her husband with the LSA um, seeds and were able to break his cycle. So she was the one who discovered that you know, LSA was out there and it would work for, for clusters. So very quickly, we got that word out to everybody in the UK that, well, you can order these seeds online. Uh, they're perfectly legal to order them. It's just not legal to eat them. So <laughs> or order these seeds. And so then we kind of broke down that protocol also to find out, you know, dosages and what seeds, and yeah, preparation. You don't just and, eat them. <laughs> right. You just don't eat them. Um, and so a lot of people in the UK switched over very quickly to LSA just because they could get their hands on it quickly and not have to wait 45 days to grow their own mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And Um, were they finding that it was more effective than psilocybin? Like my, I, this is like very, maybe like simplistic, but it's like longer dose curve. So longer efficacy, you know, like psilocybin is three to five hours. LSA from what I understand is similar to LSD. It's like eight, eight to 10 hours. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's also what we've always, you know, questioned. First of all, um, LSD we think is probably the, the best treatment and then LSA and then psilocybin. And they're all really close. Um, and you're going to, probably have good results on one or the other. Um, the good thing about the LSA is you can get those really easily and really quickly and you could try it. And even if it doesn't work really effectively, you'll be able to know whether or not you're on the right track and that, that psychedelics may be for you and might really work well for you. So it's a, a it's a good testing ground. Um, but once people know that, you know, for a hundred dollars they can grow a year supply of medicine in their closet, it's a it's a huge deal for people because the year before I started growing mushrooms, I spent twenty thousand dollars on treatments for my cluster headaches. The year I discovered mushrooms, I spent a hundred dollars on treatments for my cluster headaches. And that's basically what, what I've spent, you know, every year since then. So it's a huge deal. And being able to grow your own medicine is an incredible feeling. I mean, finally, you have some control over your treatment. And, you know, you don't need to beg a doctor for a new prescription. You don't need to call and make appointments. You don't need to, you know, go through what it is that somebody else is telling you might work. You know, you have something that's working for you and you can grow it yourself is an incredible um, feeling and um, kind of a a release of a lot of pressure and tension. And um, so, yeah, being able to grow your own is is a big deal. To me, I also think it's 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 uh, it's um, positive and necessary revolutionary work, too. 
you know, like what is like, uh, it's the obligation of any, of any good citizen to, um, it's the obligation of any good citizen to resist unjust laws or like to break unjust laws or something to this effect. Yeah. And, you know, all around the world, of course, but especially the United States has been a huge player in the absolutely unnecessary, um, gross, like blanket criminalization of all and banning you know, right. of all psychedelic compounds. Um, and also not to mention the long standing history all across much of the world, because that's the direction the church spread, but uh, of the suppression of, of herbal remedies, even now, you know, like corporations, it's like, Oh, but they're tying to the, to the medical institution. It's like, yeah, by the pharmaceutical, by the pharmaceutical, by the pharmaceutical, that's where the profit is. Right. You know, and, and then the history of course of like, the witch trials and all the rest of herbalists, you know, being brutally murdered because, you know, they're not going through the church or what have you for their, for their medicine. Um, right. So yeah, to me, I see it as like a revolutionary and, and uh, sort of like an act of like larger, an empowerment to the larger humanity to take it into your own hands and grow your own medicine in this way. Right. Yeah. It was, um, you know, being a part of the community when it just kind of d discovered and, you know, my personal knowledge as far as how effective it is and how life-changing it could be, this wasn't something that I could just kind of take my treatment and go home with it. It was like, I know that this can help a lot of people that are suffering and they're killing themselves literally. literally. Yeah. Um, so this wasn't knowledge that the community could just sit on and not share um, because they, they knew they could, how much suffering was involved and that they could actually help people that they know and that they're, you know, and people they don't know. And so it was, so we've always had a really strong community to, to get it out there and let people know about it. Um, you know, I ended up on the front page of our, one of the, Chicago newspapers, which back then when the newspapers had large circulation and everybody read newspapers, um, I was interviewed by the, the health editor and ended up on the, the front page of the Chicago Sun-Times with a picture of me and a description of how I was treating my cluster headaches. And then I was growing my own medicine. And plus when I was actually taking it, I was, you know, talked about those maintenance doses on the 4th of July and, uh, New Year's Eve. So when that article came out, you know, it put, I didn't mind it coming out. It's like, whatever, that's fine. But my family was a little bit worried that the DEA was going to knock gonna, on my door. Yeah, I was going to say, I, kick in your door I, more like <laughs> kick in my door. They could just knock on the door and, yeah. you know, on 4th of July and come on in. And, yeah. um, Back then, really, I mean, we were really trying to get a lot of publicity, first of all, to let people know that these were working and, you know, we had research going on and plus wanting people to know about cluster headaches. You know, I would end up getting a lot of contacts from news people that <clears throat> when they heard that we were treating cluster headaches with psychedelics, I mean, psychedelics was the big hook for them to write an article about because they would want to write an article about psychedelics. But by the time the interview got over, the story would end up being more about cluster headaches than it would be about psychedelics, um, explaining what people were going through with cluster headaches. And, well, to be, and, to be, to be and, honest, Bob, it, that, that's why I focus so heavily on like, yeah, we did an hour just on the cluster headaches because. Yeah. And I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's usually where the stories would go. It would be like, well, this is a one heck of a community that's suffering. And oh, by the way, they, they, they treat it with psychedelics. It wasn't, well, we've got this group of people that are using psychedelics and it also helps their clusters. It's like, you know, <clears throat> these are people that had never used a psychedelic at all for their entire life. And for the last 40 years, they've been seeing commercials of this is your brain on drugs and, you know, horror stories about what would happen if they ever took, you know, mushrooms or LSD. And so it, you know, it takes people a while to get past that and, and say, I got to give this a try. Um, yeah. I mean, how do you unlearn a lifetime of like, 
of fear, of socially embedded fear and stigma. Right. It's, it's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. It is very difficult. And so, you know, our main goal was just, well, here's the information. Here's the research. This is what we understand. Um, take your time. You know, when you're ready, we'll be here. Contact us. And if you need any help, let us know. Um, but yeah, you know, I've had people that have I've talked to for 10 years and I'll finally say, well, I finally made the, the leap and damn, I wish I had tried this sooner. But, you know, and but people need to get over a hump. And a lot of them are doing jobs that they could lose if they get drug tested. Um, a lot of them are really afraid that, um, you know, if other people at their work found out that they were using psychedelics. They could lose their job, and that we talked about earlier. You know, building a career or holding a job is difficult enough as it is um, if you've got the clusters. So to, to add that uh, worry on top of everything else is um, difficult for for people. So all we well, can do is for, keep on giving them, just giving giving them information so they could they can make a um, well learned. You know, decision. So yeah, yeah, it, it, like um, a properly educated choices, informed choices. Yep. Have is it in your documentation? Like I, I don't know if this is true. This is an assumption, so I, I could be obviously incorrect. Is that um, that things like psilocybin don't show up on drug tests anyways because they're usually they're because the things that they break down to in the brain are just the same things that the rest of our brain has. So you're not gonna you're not gonna p test psilocybin the way you would cocaine or correct yeah. it's a it's a very expensive test and it needs to be tested for specifically and and the drug tests and all the things they're looking for in airports and things i mean if it's not psilocybin and that lsd you know they're looking for the people that are smuggling you know heroin and fentanyl and you know a lot of other things but Sure, and that it's awful like, that like horrible drug stuff, cannabis. <laughs> that horrible drug cannabis, yeah, yeah, that they arrested John Lennon for in uh, Tokyo one one year, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I don't think we talked about it in the interview, but I I know that in the pre-interview, so I'll just put this here so we don't have to talk about it because I have just one final question before I get you to give us more information about cluster busters. Um, is that you know cannabis is also something that from what you understand through the community is that it just generally doesn't help um with um with the cycles or the attacks yeah that's correct correct that, yeah. that's correct yeah it uh, a lot of people have tried it but um yeah it, it really doesn't doesn't help so here's this last question um the present landscape for psychedelic tryptamines is or like the the catalog of available is way bigger than psilocybin lsd dmt lsa it is i mean just to cal uh, to cal tickle um you know uh, uh, sasha shogun's book you know there's 350 in there and that was just the beginning right. um and even in, in your documentation from 2011, you talked about a, a non-psychoactive analog of, of LSD to, to B, Bromo, I believe, LSD. In the last few years, has there any, is there anything sort of, maybe you don't want to speak to it because you don't want to accidentally, you know, increase attention to it, but uh, in, in, you know, public attention to it because that often results in, in these types of molecules getting banned, unfortunately. But like, right. is there anything that has come up that you've been, that the community has been like, whoa, I noticed 4-M-E or 4-H-O-M-E-T works even better than LSD or something to this effect, like anything like that? Um, yeah, in the last couple of years, I mean, there are billions of dollars being, you know, directed towards this sort of research and everybody is really kind of uh, trying to find their foothold into it. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people have um, are looking at the different molecules that they think that they have proprietary rights to. Um, you know, my, my big issue or one of my big issues with this 
um, what's going on with Wall Street and all these companies right now is uh, they're all at the point where they're hiring more lawyers than they're hiring researchers. And uh, that's going to cause a lot of issues and slow things down. It's going to stop some people from doing good research. Um, it's going to add to the, the cost um, of whatever these medications are going to be once they are approved. You know, it looks like um, it's going to add to the profit. It's going to add to the it's, it's profits. Add, add to the yeah. profits. Correct. Um, but at least in the U.S., in prescription medications aren't cheap to begin with. Um, and we'll see how these things end up getting priced out. But uh, it's just like with the cannabis industry, you know, <clears throat> the prices at some of these shops are just, you know, incredibly expensive. Mm-hmm. Well, I think um, what I was I was speaking yeah. to is is you know, like I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm uh, <clears throat> revealing the magic trick to anyone here, but there's a lot of companies in Canada, around the world, but in Canada and the U.S. that sell psychedelic molecules um, for research purposes only, not for human right. consumption, not, con- you know, not certified by the FDA. Um, and some of them are like radically similar to psilocybin and, and, and these things, even to the point where some of them are being taken up by uh, different of these different sort of biotech companies in order to sort of like get their patents around these particular molecules. I know, uh, was it last year or the year before, the FDA was looking to ban five of these novel right. tryptamines. And there was, they ended up not doing it um, because a bunch of researchers and, and industry leaders were like, don't do this. Like once you put these in schedule one, like it is just going to destroy the ability to develop these medicines. Right. And, and speaking of the prof, profit seeking behaviors and like the, the sort of like, we'll say like, um, I don't know if immoral, seemingly from my perspective, unethical behaviors on behalf of some of these companies, there's a company called field trip who I believe are based in Canada here. At least they, they have some offices here in Canada they were developing one of these molecules. And of course they wrote a letter of like, Oh no, like don't do this. Don't do this. Like this molecule is just too important. So it's the one that they're developing. And then they were like, but criminalize the rest of them for sure. Those are dangerous. You know, it's like, Oh, come oh. on, go fuck yourself. Are you kidding? Pardon yeah. my language, but like, yep. nope. come on. Yep. Yep. I see a lot of that going on. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, what happened was a lot of, rich white people decided to get into the money-making business with psychedelics. And, you know, that's, that's what's happening. And there's a, there are a lot of good companies that are trying to develop things and going about the right way with the research, um, and, and trying to help people. Um, but yeah, they're probably having to hire lawyers to fight, you know, the other lawyers that are trying to, you know, get their molecule to the finish line first. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was always the big thing with me and the research and being a schedule one with the psychedelics was blocking research on LSD blocks all the research and all the things that you can take off from that. I mean, people can't have LSD in their lab to change the molecule a little bit. Um, and find, you know, non hallucinogenic treatments, um, and you know everything else that can shoot off of you know some basic research with psilocybin or LSD, you know who knows where that's going to go. It's going to explain a lot of things. We're going to learn why things work and why things don't work and how they work. I mean, all of that research is blocked and doesn't get taken into uh, you know effect of moving treatments forward for people. Sure. I mean, like it it is accessible. But it's just so prohibitively expensive that it is effectively blocked, right? Yes. It's like, oh yeah, it's a, it's effective, but we're talking like the many, many hundreds of thousands, to the millions of dollars to just run, just like I think it's like I, I don't know, but it's really up there just to even f- be said, like to say yes, you can. And that doesn't include all the measures that your lab needs to underplace. That doesn't include the cost of them buying it from the DEA, because like that's where you can get the drug is directly from their suppliers, which I think is pretty right. shifty. Yep. Um, 
but yeah, I, 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 you know, I genuinely feel like when such a time comes that, that those that follow us, um, look back the, the, the blanket banning of, of, uh, psychedelic drugs is going to be looked at as one of the greatest failures of our civilization. Um, certainly <laughs> the destruction of the biosphere, uh, uh, that's, that's gonna, that's gonna take yeah. it up maybe a several, not just higher, but, um, yeah. you know, through the, through the fingers crossed, clear vision of hindsight, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see that that was a bad choice on our end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're getting there, but, um, it's going to take a while to, um, the DEA, I mean, they, sh once they get their hands on something, they don't like to give it up. And um, I've read some court transcripts that I just, I wanted to reach through the transcript and choke, you know, some of these DEA agents and, and some of the, their testimony. And it was just amazing. And um, yeah, a lot of important research has been you know, blocked for, for decades. We're decades behind on this kind of basic research. and you know these new companies are needing to do all this safety research because the when the safety research was done back in the 50s and 60s FDA do, doesn't accept that safety research because they've changed guidelines on how you you know collect that data and and how many mice you gave it to and you really need to give it to dogs or whatever they don't accept all of that safety research so you know, all of these companies are starting from scratch on this research and having to spend, you know, millions of dollars to find out if there is some connection and, you know, th if their molecule can help people. And um, we should be long past that on all the safety. You know, there's, there's a lot of safety data for mushrooms for thousands of years, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. So, so let's, let's, let's close out here, you know, speaking of the, the, the changing sort of legislative and legal and medical sort of scenario around psychedelics for a number of conditions such as, you know, cluster headaches, it's slow and it has a gross history. Um, and it's also moving. And, uh, despite the sort of like pace that it's moving at this point, your organization, the organization that you're, um, that you're speaking through cluster busters has been boots on the ground grassroots from what I understand, helping to educate people uh, and helping to you know, public advocacy, public education, um, community building, pushing for research. Um, so before we close out, can you give us a little rundown just quickly? Like, you know, what is cluster busters? And what is it that you're offering and where can people go to get in contact with your organization, either to learn from you or to dialogue or to collaborate? Well, yep. thanks for the opportunity. We, um, we have a website, um, clusterbusters.org, which gives a lot of information on all treatments for cluster headaches. Um, and describes a lot of our advocacy work that's going on. Uh, we are involved in helping write legislation in a lot of different states right now, also on a federal level. Um, and these things take a long time and they take a lot of work. So we're all, always looking for new advocates to, to help us do this work. Um, we've been around officially since 2002 always completely run by volunteers we have a two or three employees at this point but 90 percent of the work is done by volunteers um some of which have been around for 20 years advocating running message boards um traveling to washington dc to to fight for different legislation um and and involved in a lot of the research that's going on um so there's a lot of information on our website We're, and we want to help number one, people with cluster headaches and headache disorders in general. And we have a lot of different things happening that, uh, because it's a very complicated system. 
that that takes a long time to make small changes, which is what I've learned over the last 20 years. That you know, small victories sometimes take 10 years. Um, but uh, more than happy to always answer questions about, about how people can get involved um, or how we can help some family member or somebody else that they care about. Um, yeah, because most people probably still haven't seen a doctor that knows a lot about cluster headaches and are in charge of their health care. Um, so we can give them as much information as, as um, they can handle. We've got a lot of information for them. So. And the website again was www.clusterbusters, one word, dot org. Okay. Uh, Bob Wold, thank you so much for your time on the show here today uh, and uh, the work that you've been doing for the last 20 years. Thanks. It was a great, great chatting with you and um, hope to talk to you again soon, James. And cut. Okay, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Adventures Through the Mind, especially you've listened all the way to the end. I appreciate that. Uh, if you want to learn more about Bob's work, of course, clusterbusters.org. Um, and the links to that are going to be in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com. Also, Clusterbusters is having their first ever European patient conference in Glasgow, Scotland. In Glasgow, Scotland, May 5th to the 7th of 2023. And uh, if you're interested in checking that out, details to that will also be in the show notes to this episode, or you can find them over on the Cluster Busters website. Finally, I want to make a comment about something I had said with respect to the FDA and the DEA and who pays for what in order to access Schedule 1 substances. I found out that what I said wasn't entirely correct uh, about who owns the labs that are um, that people have to pay to get their schedule one substances from. And I might've switched DEA and FDA in my discussion there. So please just fact check those things before you, uh, before you repeat them elsewhere. I am prone to mistakes in the heat of the moment. Fancy that. Um, so, but I also wanted to be upfront about recognizing that, which I didn't until the post review. And uh, that's it. That's all. Thanks for tuning into this episode. If you want to support the show, like I said, you can do so through Patreon, one-time PayPal uh, donation. Uh, and you could also follow me on social media at James W. Jesso, J-E-S-S-O. And, uh, or you can sign up for my newsletter. Links to all of that are in the description of this episode, wherever you might be checking it out. And uh, that's all for now. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you on the next episode. Take care.